Spirit in the Sky from Doctor and the Medics on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The band has a new lineup and making new music. With me now is the good Doctor himself. Welcome to the show. Hello, it's lovely to be here. How are we doing? Doctor, we played your music on this show several times. One thing that your fans may or may not know, and something you just mentioned to me off the air, is that Doctor and the Medics has always been one of the most punctual bands in music history. (laughs) yeah we're more punctual than the beatles or the rolling stones not a lot of people know that they're not statistics that the music business tends to publish but yeah we know we are we are pretty punctual apparently 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 um the levelers uh i spoke to mark chadwick from the levelers uh i don't know how big they are over there but they're a great group over here and we had an argument we actually had an argument about who was the most punctual band between the two of us and we got down to such minute that in the end he had to get down on one knee and say you are more punctual than i am and it came down to an argument over three minutes and that's so, so yeah yeah i'm fairly i'm, fa- I'm fairly uh, ocd about that as well <laughs> well you may not get awards for that but i'm pretty sure event people and and producers are very happy with the punctuality oh well you know there is a there is a, there is a reason to it and it's not just being um it's not just being sort of a bit train spotterish and a bit, oh, no, everybody's got to be there 10 minutes before here. And The reason is, if you're doing a show or an event, you've got things that can go wrong. You've got stuff like traffic, you can break down, unforeseen circumstances. Even if those happen, you want to be there on time for your show. But more importantly, you want to be there in time to park your car, eat, find out where your hotel is, relax, and then get ready to go on stage. Because then, if you're going to go and do a performance – you're relaxed in your head, your body's good, you're fed, you feel good. If you're stressed and you've turned up anywhere, you're going to lose your voice halfway through the show. It's it's simple as that. So there is a very good reason for getting there on time, and it is to do with respect for the audience, I think. That's true, and you have to be on your A game all the time. Uh, people don't realize that, and, and it's not very easy to do that. It gets harder as you get older. Well, I say harder, it's not harder. It just means you have to pay more attention to it. When you're 25, 30... You can go out all the night before, you can get completely hammered, you can uh, have no sleep, and you can bounce on stage after half an hour's kip in the dressing room, and you can get away with it. At 54, you can't. So you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got to make, as I say, it's a, it's a respect thing for the audience. You've got to make sure you look after yourself. Well, let's go back to the beginning, when you were in the uh, younger years and were able to do all of that. A story about... Doctor in the Medic's formation says you started the band on a five-pound bet. Is that true, and how did that come about? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, I was, at the time, I was a DJ. I started off as a nightclub DJ. We used to have one-night psychedelic all-nighters and uh, stuff like that back in uh, 1982, 83, uh, when, when, just as we were starting. And I was predominantly a DJ. And uh, one of the guys whose bands played our club, he we, we had a kind of an animated discussion at which point he said I could never be a singer and could never form a band. And he had a concert in two weeks' time. And he said, uh, that if you can support us, form a band and support us, he, we had a five-pound bet on it. Um, so I had two weeks. I got the band together. I was DJing as the doctor, so it was the first name I thought of, Doctor and the Medics, never thinking I'd be sat here over 30 years later uh, recounting this story and still going. You know, I mean, it was kind of a... a a five minute name for a five minute band that just the five minutes never, st- I guess the egg timer never rang and we never stopped. But, uh, yeah, we, we we did the gig and we actually blew them off stage. So they, they were the Marble Staircase, a fairly obscure uh, British psychedelic revival band of the 80s, but very good. But, uh, yeah, we blew them off uh, in two weeks, and he never paid me the fiver. I think he had a bit of a sulk about the fact we were better than they were. So uh, I never got me five pound. <laughs> now he owes you that plus interest. There we go. <laughs> oh, do you know what? I might work. One day when I've got nothing to do, I might work out the interest and write him a strongly worded letter. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you, you tell him. I mean, you're a doctor, but you can also change it to lawyer in the medics for a little while and then come back. Now, as long as you get the five pounds, I'm sure you'll be happy. That's the most important thing in this business. Get the money. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't think you'd put together a timeless track, though, like uh, Spirit in the Sky, your cover of that. Well, no, not at all. Um, we, I mean, we were in those days a very uh, indie band. I mean, in uh, certainly in England at the time, in Britain rather, um, you had this split between indie and mainstream, you know. Um, and when you had a hit, you were seeing, I don't know if the, the term you don't hear it these days, of selling out. People say you sold out. 
And um, I, we'd had a number indie number one on the indie charts with a song with a EP called Happy but Twisted, and uh, we kind of assumed that was our path that we would develop on the indie circuit, put out a couple of albums, become if you like a cult band, and that would be our status in life. And we were quite happy with that. For us to go on and have a massive international number one was not in the plan. And in fact, uh, it kind of all wasn't positive. Um, yeah, we had a great five years off the back of that partying around the world. And, uh, you know, we uh, continued to record and everything else. But a lot in England, a lot of the original fans, the indie fans, uh, thought we said, you've sold out, you know, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of them walked away. So we kind of it was a kind of a yeah, yeah. Kind of, kind of a weird thing really you had this number one hit and a lot of your original fans said oh no we're not following you anymore so that that was kind of weird so no it was not in the plan um but however no regrets at all and here i am 30 odd years later still celebrating it so it's, it was wonderful well that's the funny thing it didn't seem like dr and the medics set out to put together a hit song or two and and then become full as they would put it sellouts there are bands that did that i suppose people were so jaded at the time it was it was the mid 80s and seeing a lot of bands cater to the ind the independent types or the uh, or, or uh, the alternative music stations and then turn out a hit and start churning out hit after hit after hit people got turned off and i guess they didn't realize that you just had the hit it just happened that happened with a lot of bands oh yeah exactly exactly i mean i think there was a bit of an engineering towards it by the record company i can't uh, you know obviously put all the credit on the band I think it had a hell of a lot of promotion from the... I think they heard it and thought, oh, this is going to be a hit kind of thing. And I think that happened. But um, yeah, no, you know, it, was, it wasn't it was the plan, but uh, we soldiered on anyway. And I think over the years, you know, we've kind of got the old fans now creeping back. Uh, I mean, I was talking about this last night, actually, and I suddenly realised that I've had a 15-year cut. I've been, I've, I've been coming back for 15 years, which is longer than most bands' career. Uh, so, you know, it must be the longest comeback. And you never know, there might be another 15 years added on to the end of it. <laughs> well, I'm sure people are still going to want to see you and, and not just perform the one song, but perform your many others. Here's the thing about Doctor and the Medics. In a time where the synth bands were really huge and it just kept rolling synth 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 now believe me i love my synth and, and that was the big thing with new wave and and the alternative music however doctor and the medics even though your background was as a club dj was a sort of mix of 60s psychedelic and very very heavy guitars which was something that was very different even for an era of well let's just say it very different music well yeah i'm glad you spotted that because um when we started the band, it was a bit of an antithesis. We, I'd started DJing, and there's a thing in London in 1984, 85, 86 called the Psychedelic Revival. And I guess I was responsible partly for starting that. Um, we started a club called The Clinic originally that became Alice in Wonderland, and it was a psychedelic club. But when I say psychedelia, uh, I mean, for example, we'd have two DJs, myself and, and a guy called Chris, and we would... Uh, play one track each and feed off them so you could go from the 13th floor elevators to the doors to johnny cash to you know to and anything that we put on there it, it kind of and we kind of mixed the new and the old so we were playing nirvana then as well at the time and it was kind of this unholy blend of music and that's what we liked um and of course at the time nobody was really doing that live so when we formed the medics we wanted it to be the antithesis of the synth Suck your, suck your cheeks in and lean on the wall brigade the one people who are taking themselves so seriously i mean as you say there's absolutely nothing wrong with that music there's nothing wrong with any music music is there to be shared enjoyed not everybody enjoys the same music but it's important to understand that if it might you don't like that music it doesn't make that music crap it, apart from if you're talking about certain forms of jazz obviously that goes out the rule book but most music but so, so the synth stuff um was, but we just felt it was a bit po-faced, a bit too serious. So we took – the idea behind the medics was to take uh, both in terms of appearance and in terms of sound, uh, in terms of appearance, the worst elements of psychedelia, glam, and punk and put them together, which is how we got the look we did. And in terms of sound was to put the best elements of psychedelia, glam, and punk together, which uh, we hopefully did. So you had this unholy mash of these three cultural styles, wham, bam, in the middle of the 80s appearing. And uh, yeah, and it seemed to work and people seemed to like it. With me is Doctor from Doctor and the Medics right here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. We said it before, 
The band has a new lineup and some new music coming out. We'll talk about all of that straight ahead on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Waterloo from Doctor and the Medics right here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. A cover of an ABBA classic. Doctor is with me right now. We talked about the band's origins, the five pound bet that you're going to be collecting with interest, obviously, and the fact that you guys were the most punctual band in the history of the game. And and the respect for the audience, which is very important. I suppose that you already had that concept of respect for the audience and knowledge of music and what gets people going as a DJ for all those years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. By the way, I just want to go back to what you said there. Anyone joining this interview now, right, <laughs> saying that a band <laughs> was collecting five pound and was the most punctual in the world doesn't make us sound like the most exciting band, does it? But, you know, <laughs> I thought it was quite funny. Uh, but no, uh, absolutely. And this is the, the whole key is it is about the music and it's about the love of the music. Um because um, I, I, I predominantly started as a fan, you know, and I think um, you, you get different types of musicians. You get some who are genuine art. I suppose there's a, no, we're all artists. I don't, I don't quite know how to phrase this, but you do get some like myself who are obviously out and out fans. And we love being part of this great machine that is music. I think you get some people who are so full of themselves that they think they are the entire music business. And I think it's a different thing. And they're very begrudging of their respect for other artists. Whereas um, certainly with myself and all of the band, when we do bigger festivals and we're with old bands that we've maybe not met for 20 years or bigger names, we're out there for that. You know, you get these people who turn up for the gig. They do their bit. They're in the bus and they're off to the hotel. What's the point in that? I remember when we played with Simple Minds, uh, at Milton Keynes Bowl, it was a hell of a lineup that day, um, a massive concert. We were the first band to arrive on set and they had to kick us off at the end of it. You know, we were just there. That was your day. That is why you came into this business for days like that. So why sit in your travel lodge, turn up 20 minutes before you're meant to go on, play, get back in your van and go back to your travel lodge? Why do that when there is this amazing spectacle of everything you love? So, yes, it's about the love of the music and an appreciation of music. And as you say, quite rightly, I started off as a DJ because I had this massive record collection because I loved it, because I loved the music and I wanted to share it with people. And the best way to do that was to go into a club and you looked at your dance floor. And if it wasn't full, you thought on your feet and you changed direction and you made sure your dance floor was full. Not maybe at nine o'clock when people were coming in and want to sit down for a beer. That's when you play the stuff that they can sit and listen to. That's when you played, you know, your longer doors tracks that nobody else was playing or the Velvet Underground that nobody else was playing in London at the time. That's when you played that sort of darker, seedier side. And then you built it up. And, yeah, you kind of know. And I think the same thing is when you're performing, you know, yeah, certainly a band like us, we play to different venues, different, you know, for this year, this year, for example, we we played to a hundred people and we played to seventeen thousand people, and you've got to put a different head on for each show. And it doesn't matter even if there's one person there, you've got to give them a reason why they're watching and you're being watched. And if you can't do that for one person, you shouldn't be doing the job. And as you say, all about respect for sharing that music with people. With me is Doctor from Doctor and the Medics, right here on Revenge of the Eighties Radio. Putting the band together, we talked about the style of music, but what about the style of costume or dress? Where did you get the idea for the uh, the use of the makeup and obviously the uh, way out uh, clothing styles? Well, I mean, I, I mean, as I, I kind of said earlier, we, it was meant to originally be an unholy. Um, I mean, at that time, goth wasn't uh, didn't exist. The, the goth style didn't exist, so we kind of took these worst elements of punk psychedelia and, and glam rock and put them all together. That's why we had the platform boots and everything else. But it began to take a life of its own um and um we started our own shop we had the club alice in wonderland so we started a shop called planet alice um where we started making the sort of clothes that we liked that we wanted to wear and that we thought you know fans of ours wanted to know well, where'd you get the clothes well you can't so we started a shop which ran it ran for about five or six years it was quite successful um and um eventually I, I think our style just began to take a life on of its own and it evolved and I suppose if you look back at it now, you can see, uh, you know, it was a kind of a we were kind of pre goth goth. Now, a large part of that, obviously, was the fact that we wore makeup. Well, for me, that was uh, tipping my hat and respect to the long lineage of British artists who've worn sort of black and white makeup. It started with Screaming Lord Such, which uh, people in America may not know. He, he had a hit over here with, with Jack the Ripper. Um, I did a few gigs with Such. He was, he was a lovely man. 
Then, of course, you had Arthur Brown, who did the makeup. Um, and then, of course, after that, you had Roy Wood and Wizard. And I kind of felt that people, there was not enough makeup being worn on stage. Yeah, the New Romantics did it in a kind of a subtle, you know, uh, poserish type of way. But I thought, no, get the black makeup on, over the top. This is rock. For me, um, I, didn't, I, I thought that the bands that I loved, and again, this is uh, not every band should be the same. If you, you can have bands, you know, in T-shirts and denims and acoustic guitars sat down and you'll have a wonderful gig and a wonderful experience. But that just wasn't for me. I liked the bands that didn't look like they were from this planet, you know, and obviously the American equivalent of that, of course, was Kiss. And of course, Alice Cooper, who took it. Uh, I think, you know, the funny thing is, there's a very different thing between the British and American ways of wearing makeup. And I think we do it one way and you do it another way. And it's, you know, I think the, the, the regimentation of the kiss look and everything else is very American. I don't think you'd have that uh, in, in England. I, I think we're far more the way Arthur Brown and myself used to do it, which is uh, I, it's far more, if you like, bordering on hippie. Um, so, yeah, so that was the influence for that. It was out of respect for that lineage. And however, since I've done it, there's been very few British artists who've done it since. And I think it's about time if anyone's listened to this in england get your makeup out people we need more makeup back in in british rock <laughs> we've got to we've got a two makeup free zone we don't want that anymore maybe we djs could do the same thing i have often asked about whether i should wear makeup or not doctor but i've been told to wear a paper bag instead that's a different story. <laughs> I assumed I assumed you were way wearing makeup because it's radio. I can't tell. I'm here in full stage gear and makeup. I'm disappointed to hear you're not. No, nope, paper bag. I'm just going with the suggestion. <laughs> Chris Cordani here with the Doctor on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Let's fast forward to today. Doctor and the Medics, it's you. You're back on stage. You have a new lineup. Dynamic, just like the original band. Let's talk about the new lineup. The, the thing is, we never... Uh, the word split up. We never really split up as such. It just... Um, was slowly grinding to a halt and dying of a natural death. I think in 1998, I think we played six shows. Um, and I was offered a tour at that point with um, a, a guy who said, look, there's this circuit of pubs uh, in the UK. Uh, I can offer you this tour, uh, but you've got to play cover versions. Now, we'd been up until that point, we'd been 90% an original band. I mean, obviously, Spirit was a cover, and Waterloo was a cover. But we'd done uh, three albums up until that point and um, uh, various other recordings. And I said to the guys who were left in the band at the time from the original lineup, I'm going to do this tour. And they didn't want to do it. So they kind of handed me the keys. Uh, in fact, Steve's last words to me on the subject were, if you can make money by flogging the rotting carcass of this band, then do so with my blessing. So I said, thank you, I will. So then in about 1999, uh, we just went over to the new lineup two of which are still with me, um, and we did this tour, and I was going to end it. I was just going to do this tour and finish it all. Uh, I'd kind of fallen out of love with music, um, and I didn't like – I didn't – get the buzz from performing and it was and some of the places we were playing at that time were fairly dreadful so at the end of the tour i was going to kind of jack it all in and then the guys in the band just turned around and said right boss what's next and their excitement and their enthusiasm kind of reignited my fire a little bit and so we then went on and we started slowly very very slowly building it up over a space of about eight or nine years we were slowly getting into other markets and people respecting us. At that time, you've got to remember, right by the end of the 90s, Doctor and the Medics couldn't pay to play anywhere. Nobody wanted to know us. We were so, you know, a, a non-entity uh, that nobody on the live circuit was interested in us at all. So we gradually built our way up and up. And over a period of about eight years, we got to where we were on the Rewind circuit. Now, that over here is a massive circuit, and there's similar gigs to it, like Jack Up the 80s and Flashback to the 80s. Massive uh, concerts. You're playing to up to 17,000, 20,000 people. And we kind of worked our way back to playing on those kind of venues. And now, uh, on the live circuit, it's got to the point where we're – uh, we, we, we're doing very well at festivals. We headline the smaller festivals. We go on the bigger festivals, you know, on a mid bill band. And that's been a lot of miles and a lot of work, but it's also been because of my band uh, because they are amazing. I mean, I've got a young female singer now. Um, I've got a, a, you know, young, young guitarist who've joined Aidan John, who've been with me for all that time. 
and the dynamicism of it. And I'm completely back in love with music and with performing, mainly as a result of how they play, you know, that they excite me. You can't be on stage with a band as good as them and not get excited. So it's been a long old journey. And as I jokingly said, this has been a 15 year comeback, you know, <laughs> but, but, a, but a very enjoyable one that has totally reignited my love of what I do. And not long ago, you and the band shot a video for your cover of You Spin Me Round Like a Record. I listened to it at first and thought, hey, those heavy guitars actually lend themselves to the song extremely well. In fact, it's almost like the song was meant for those guitars. Well, I'm really pleased you said that because, um, I mean, the reason we, 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 we started doing that and um, that record, that recording and that video has opened the doors to everything that's happening now because... Up until that point, we would, we, we'd, as I say, we'd built up the live reputation. We got onto this circuit, and I suddenly realised that you know these guys had never done the whole thing of releasing a single, making a video, putting it out there, and being seen. And they'd done all these miles with me, played all these shows, and they'd never taken part in that process. So we decided to go with it, and uh, we went for you, Spin Me, because as you say, it, we, we started covering it and doing it at gigs. We opened the show with it. And uh, it goes down well. And it was getting a lot of hits on my SoundCloud account, um, far more than anything else apart from Spirit. So I said, obviously, that's the one we're going to go with. Um, now, Dan, our guitarist, we recorded it in his studio. And it's very faithful to how we play it live. So it came about quite naturally. Um, and I think everything we try and do, uh, we, we, we do a lot of covers now. When we're doing a lot of these 80 shows, we're working on one now. We're doing Don't Leave Me This Way. Uh, but and uh, we, we've got that. That is not a heavy rock song, but we've done. We've worked it out now, and it sounds very mid '80s metal. It sounds wonderful. I can't wait to do it live. So I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah, take an '80s song, put a heavy rough behind it, and then put our vocals over the top of it, and it's a formula that does seem to work. It really does. Talk about some of the other new music you're looking to put together. Well, um, as a result, this, this is actually the lineage of this interview is flowing very well, I have to say, in terms of a time scale, because we put out You Spin Me. And then sh shortly after that, uh, Barbara Sabel um, contacted me about maybe doing a remix of You Spin Me. And I kind of said, well, that's cool. But why don't we do a remix of Spirit? And wow. Yeah. So we then went in, we re-recorded the parts for the remixes. And we put it out. And this whole remix scene was something that I knew nothing about. Um, you know, it was a new new territory, territory for me. Um, but I was excited by it. You know, um, I always am by any new challenge, by any different way of presenting the music. I once did an unplugged medics tour as well, you know, with a guitar, a ukulele and congos. And that was a challenge. So this was, this was something absolutely new. And I've got to be honest, it comes back to what I said about respect and love of the music. And you're probably well aware that with Barbara, she, she's someone who does what she does because she loves it. And if she gets behind you as an artist and everything else and puts all that energy and effort into you, you can't help but feed off that. And anybody who loves what they do so much deserves instant respect. So I just thought, here we go. This is something, you know, I've got to just jump on the back of this and uh, see what happens. And so we sent the stuff to all the, the bits we recorded over to America and all around the world. And then suddenly these remixes came in. And I have to say that since we re released the original Spirit in the Sky, various people have tried to remix it. And it's stunk. It's been awful. Um, and suddenly I got all these amazing remixes coming in. And I thought, this is something, they, they, these sound good. And, uh, and so, so that, now that's it. They're due to come out on the 31st of October, Halloween. There you are. Can't forget that one. Or the week, a couple of weeks before, actually. I don't know the exact release date. I'm sure you'll know it. But it's also that it's all up and running uh, by Halloween. And we're doing the 29th anniversary of Spirit in the Sky. So that's, that's remixes of Spirit in the Sky. So uh, I'm very excited to see where that goes. Very excited indeed. Yes, and Barbara has a nice team of DJs, or at least she has a lot of DJs at her fingertips that can put together some solid, I mean, spectacular remixes of uh, of tracks like Spirit in the Sky and, and many others. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, I was instantly impressed when they started coming in. Um, I mean, there were a couple that, you know, that, that we didn't take uh, for various reasons, not because they weren't good but because they didn't suit i didn't think they suit me or the or, or the or the song you know but uh all, all the ones we chose um i i thought were well certainly among the best i'd ever heard over all the years because they, they, they seemed to really get a grip of how the song needed to be treated 
to become a to, to for for a dance remix, you know. And uh, we put we put the remix on, um, you know, in rooms full of people and not said a word. And people have got up their chairs and started dancing around the room, saying, "Who is this?" And we say, "Wait for the tagline." And then of course, yes, "Spirit in the Sky." They go, "No, no, it's not, is it?" We say, "Yep, it is." So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. Are you looking to play some more live dates in support of the new music? Well, we don't stop playing live. We, you know, that that's our bread and butter. We're always playing live, and um, you know, and of course, we're always playing Spirit. Uh, and that's been put that some people say you should, uh, you know, you should play a bit. It's hard to do a remix version live as a three-piece band, but we're going to give it a, li- a bit of a go. Yeah, definitely. But uh, we're always gigging. Whether we'll get a chance to come over to America or not, we don't know. But you know. I never never close my mind or eyes to any opportunity. You never know. I mean, up until Barbara approached us, I never thought we'd be putting out a dance mix, you know, <laughs> looking at uh, get, getting it in, into some charts and stuff, you know. Uh, so I, I, I just going into it with my eyes open and my eyes and mind wide open. And early next year, it looks like you have another single coming out. Yeah, we're working on it now. Uh, in fact, it's just been uh, mixed by um the guy john mitchell from it bites is mixing it doing the radio mix at the moment over here um which is quite exciting it's a song called rock me and um that yeah and we're already looking at getting the remixes working on that as well so when we release the actual single we're going to put uh dan our guitarist mix we're going to have john mitchell's mix and we're going to put a couple of the dance mixes on there as well so uh, that's going to be a full package going out uh, early next year and then after that, next year, we have an album that is written, a full album, the first Doctor and the Medics album since 1996. Um, and we're going to be working on that, and that will be released next year at some point. Well, we'd definitely like to have you on to talk about that when it comes out. It will be an absolute pleasure. Doctor, thank you for joining us on Revenge of the 80s Radio. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been lovely talking to you, and, th- and thanks for uh, supporting the band and giving me airtime. It's great. It's wonderful. I really enjoyed it. Follow the band on doctorandthemedics.com. That's their website. You'll find news from the group. You'll also find out where they're going to be playing and information on all the new music coming out. Again, Doctor, thank you for joining us. We played this a couple of weeks ago, so let's play it again. Doctor and the Medics' newly released cover version of You Spin Me Round Like a Record. 